With Gears of War 4, we wanted to earn your trust. But with Gears 5, we want to push the envelope by doing new things never seen in a Gears game before. Hello everyone. I've toyed with a few ideas of how I want to start making this. I feel like I've got a lot of things I need to say, but a lot of people just won't like what I've got to say. I feel like if I do consider that though, it'll really prevent me from saying what I feel needs to be said. Um, I know that there's Gears 4 and Gears 5 fanboys out there. You know what, that's fine. If you enjoy the game, then that's great. That's what the for, and who am I to say otherwise? I know from experience that a lot of people who defend Gears 4 and 5, they simply can't, or at least they can't by using any form of logical argument. Most will tend to get offended by being proven wrong and will simply resort to insults. That helps nobody. So if you're somebody who is easily offended and is incapable of listening to an opinion that differs from your own, I highly recommend that you dislike this video and turn it off. I want to look at why a title as well known as Gears has managed to drop to such a low rating, especially so quickly. I feel that I've been seeing this happening gradually for some time now, but when trying to voice this I feel like I've got absolutely nowhere. As stated in the disclaimer at the start, I'm making this with the intent of improving things for everyone. I feel that involves telling it as I see it. That doesn't mean that I want or encourage anybody to start any hate towards anybody because I really don't want that at all. I wanted this video to be supported with some degree of substance rather than me simply rambling as to why I think what I do. I've been through a number of videos and streams from the Coalition and I've incorporated them into this. Obviously I don't own that content, but I wanted to use it in a way that gets people thinking and perhaps people can see where I'm coming from. I wanted to start with this, skill. Years came before in their life, maybe they don't know anything about it or they've never tried it. And so we've had to really come to the game with an idea about how do we make it approachable for new players. So things like boot camp, which you got to, to check out as a way to try to introduce people to the mechanics of Gears of War. The new mode that people are going to get to play in July and part of the tech test called Arcade is a, a new way to play Versus, which is a little bit more casual in the sense that it's more fun. People worry about shotgun in the face while bouncing when they think about Versus, which is <laughs> totally valid and a fun way to play, but like, trying to find another aspect to it so people don't go in and they're like, oh, you haven't been playing for the last 15 years, well then you're out. Mechanically, and we also had to co incorporate those into a new tuning update uh, for everybody. So that includes both core and competitive. And for the core gamer, uh, what we know is really important is the balance of all those basic weapons. We want to be balancing, you know, the Lancer player, you know, they want to make sure that their Lancer is, you know, feels really Lancery and the Nasher and really Nashery. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that things like the Hammer Burst uh, and the Enforcer really had a role as well. And for the core gamer to have uh, that selection of their, their basic weapon is really important. For competitive, some of the weapons were a little bit overpowered and they were cutting off some of the deeper, more skillful play. Some of the weapons were a little bit overpowered, cutting off some of the deeper, more skillful play. For competitive, some of the weapons were a little bit overpowered and they were cutting off some of the deeper, more skillful play. So we've gone in there and we've really took off the rough edges across a few different weapons to make sure that the overall experience really lets players play at the highest level possible. Move forward with the fight and stick close to teammates. When you're moving out of cover, you can get around the map faster by holding the A button to roadie run. Once you've mastered cover, wall bouncing is an advanced technique that can make or break close range firefights. To balance the faster movement, we've looked to go back to the drawing board and come up with something that added a little more risk to that faster movement reward. And the idea we came up with was to slow down the health regeneration while you're hyper bouncing. So every time you cancel, you're going to be extending the lifetime of that health regeneration until you stop moving or go into cover or just strafe normally, and then your healing speed will go back to normal. And this is a, a big trade-off that we see people making between speed, mobility, and survivability. So the best bouncers will be able to make a decision between when to cancel, when to fully slide in, when to go in the cover, and it creates a deeper movement system while still staying intuitive and letting people move the way that they want to move as opposed to forcing them into the long short system that we did before. 
Wall bouncing is an advanced technique Okay, so for me, it seemed evident that in Gears 4, they were trying to make the game easier for newer players or less skilled players. In what you've just seen, it's been stated that they're aiming for new players in Gears 5. From a business standpoint, that makes sense. Of course it does. It's more sales. But I feel like it goes beyond that and it's just been completely overlooked. Gears isn't a game that's likely to bring in new, die-hard fans. It'll bring in new players, sure, but they won't stick around. Why? Because there's no reason for them to. There's nothing to progress with and there's nothing to learn. In the past, the fun of Gears was how unique it was and the learning curve. You felt like you accomplished something every time you learned a new technique, and when you implemented that into a situation in game it paid off, you felt a sense of progress from it, like you'd improved as a player. You were constantly adding to your skill set. I feel like 99% of the skill involved with Gears is based around the nausea and movement. Are we going back into this later on in the video when talking about other points? However, as we've just seen in that video from back on Gears 4, they have actively implemented a feature to hinder wall bouncing. Despite pre-release stating that it was an advanced technique, I see no reason as to why they would have done that other than to assist new players because either they can't do it or they can't land enough shots on people who can. Whilst that's great for the new players, all that does is punish players who have spent over a decade learning how to play Gears of War properly. As highlighted in what we've just seen, back on Gears 4 it was noted that in competitive, some weapons were found to be overpowered and they were adjusted. Why was that not adjusted in core? Is this again just aiding new players but nobody highlighted that fact? I'll say again, it makes sense from a business standpoint to think about how to drive sales to new players. Of course it does, but at what cost? At the start of Gears 4, I said this and I'll say it again now at the start of Gears 5, Adjusting the game in order to help new players will simply annoy good players off the game as it's unfair for them after spending so much time learning and improving. Most new players probably won't stick around and all that's left are people who aren't very good at gears but they've learned how to use these new assisted weapons or mechanics or techniques that are in the game and they simply abuse them every match. That's why if you go back onto Gears 4 now, it's just Lancers everywhere and if you go back to Gears 3, it's just Retro and Hammerburst players everywhere. In the long run, catering to new players will kill Gears, and I feel it's happening already. As seen in the clip at the end where I was against Helios and he very kindly helped me, in my opinion he's got the best movement in Gears 5 from what I've seen from anybody. He was actively wall bouncing and I was actively trying to put minimal effort into firing my Lancer, but he still went down in almost no time. That's completely unfair on him, and when that's in an actual game that's completely unfair on the skilled player. That shouldn't be that way. Gears of War is not a game where you should be balancing a weapon against an advanced technique. That's just not fair. The advanced technique should be rewarded. If the new players can't do what the experienced players can, then quite frankly that is tough. It, they are new players for a reason. Experienced players are experienced players for a reason. You don't try and adjust the game to handicap an experienced player to aid a new player. Because at one point we were all brand new players. When I first started I was on Gears 2 and I got absolutely smacked around. And my options were give up or improve. And back then Gears of War it had a sense of, as I said before, it had a sense of accomplishment when you do improve. So I stuck at it and I improved and that's what players now, they need to do that. The only way you improve is by going against a player who is much better than you. That's how I improved and that's how everybody will improve. If you make the game to help them, nobody's improving, it's the game winning for them. That is pointless. So we also really wanted to improve the rifle play inside Gears 5. Gears has been known for its shotgun play, its side versus. Um, we wanted to make the rifle play to be able to stand amongst some of the other shooters that are on the market uh, on its own. To be able to have a game that mixed really fast, intimate shotgun combat with really high precision, um, high skill rifle combat. And to be able to get that all in a single game 
was something we tried to do with your The aim assist inside core, we really see this as a versus game that all types of Gears of War players can enjoy. While the Lancer was used to define the new combat style in Gears 5, we then brought that same philosophy to all the other weapons inside Gears 5. Watching that actually annoyed me a bit because I hadn't realised he'd said that before when I'd watched it in the past. They've intentionally made the game more rifle based. Why? Gears become successful online because of the Nasher. As I said earlier, it's where all of the skill is at. I'm not entirely sure what he means by high skilled rifle play. But I feel that term has been used wrongfully in that case. If I wanted to play a rifle game, I would not play Gears. I would go and play Call of Duty because that Call of Duty is known for its rifles. It does rifles better. You've got Battlefield as well. You've got other games more known for rifles. Why would anybody think of Gears? You just wouldn't. I used to play Gears because nothing even come close to shotgun play. But making this decision to make rifles so powerful, it's removed that uniqueness from Gears. At many times now, I've actually described both Gears 4 and 5 as COD with monsters in it. It's just not Gears no more. We've just heard it described as a high skill play. I'm sorry, but I feel that's a way of covering what it was. I feel it was a way of assisting, again, new players. Because even with recoil, it's beyond easy and nothing more than gaming basics. Left trigger and right trigger with a slight adjustment to right stick, that is not difficult. That is not skill at all. To better balance the Nasher versus the rest of the rifles, as well as to make every shot matter, we've reduced the ammo count inside the clip for the Nasher. It's gone from eight down to six. We've also changed the way that active reloads work. Now, in Gears 4, active reloads would increase your damage or stopping power on weapons. For the Nasher in Gears 5, there's no additional damage. When you land a perfect active on the white, you get a full reload up to six shots. When you land a active reload on the gray, you're only going to be reloading three, a half clip. And this means that players that can land their actives while having combat will be able to extend their fights longer than the players that can't. Now this is one more small level of skill that we've added to the game that really makes the game um, have a really high skill gap for competitive players, but we also know that for more core or casual players won't really notice this difference other than the fact that they've taken six shots and they have to reload before they get to eight. I don't know about anybody else, but what I heard from that was to hinder the good players so that new players can have more of a chance, we have done this, this and this. I have a few points I want to go over in this video, but I put these three to start together because I feel like they all tie in together. Please think back to earlier in the video when we've seen that they've added the health regen delay while bouncing. Now there's also no active boost in the Nasher, now we have less shots. What next? Will we have to active every single pellet individually? I believe that they know the Nasher and movement combined are very important in terms of skill. So if not to help new or unskilled players, why would they keep adjusting these things to make them less effective? Skill should be rewarded. If a player is good at something that takes skill, then reward them. I'll say again, if somebody can't do something, then that's tough. That's why the better player should win. To tie in all these points in relation to skill, I hear the term balanced quite a lot now, both from the devs and other players. It's so annoying. Gears just isn't a game that you balance things against each other. Gears is a game that used to have a weapon for a specific role and it was adjusted based on if it were effective or not to meet its role. Now, with the current tunings and the handicaps towards actual skilled play, it's in fact the unskilled techniques that are overpowered and they've actually become imbalanced if you want to use that sort of term. With the way the game has been made for rifles, as already stated, it's taken away all reasons to have a role for the Nasher because not only do rifles dominate at long range, but also at mid range and short range as well. Players don't seem to want to improve anymore, they just want the game to hand them everything. And when the game wins for them, there's absolutely no reason why they would want to improve, why they would want to try any sort of new technique that might take a little bit of skill or effort, because they're going to be rewarded by putting in minimal effort. And as people, that's what people tend to want to do. I need to um, like concentrate on the game. I'm like yeah. trying to read questions. On Twitter, I feel like you see a lot of tweets. I find your response to the vast majority of positive tweets. The most negative feedback tweets of receive responses. Uh, why is that? Is it your choice of uh, not allowed to answer? Um, I feel like I respond to way more negative than positive. Yeah. Because like 
we're positive, it's like, I need to read. I might like, give it a no like. If, if someone says something positive, I'm going to give it a like because it's always nice to be told something good. Yeah. So I'll yeah. give it a like. Um, but um, um, but I'm, yeah. I'm not sure what Twitter channel you mean, but like, I at least feel like on Reddit we also mine, get, I'm more responding to criticism. Well, and we also get like a lot directed at us. So just because you're tagging doesn't mean that it's like, A, it's going to get seen all the time. B, we're gonna get answered. I try to jump in at certain points in the day. Uh, usually for me is like when I get in the first thing in the morning is I'm on Twitter for a little while or I'm like, that's my kind of social time is I'm on Twitter, I'll drop by people's Twitch streams, I drop by the Discord server, all of that kind of stuff. That, just because when the day gets going, it becomes a lot harder to be, for me personally, I get pulled into a ton of meetings and that kind of stuff. So it's not like a, hey, I wish you guys would, I, I, you know, I mean, we do these streams on a week-to-week -week basis there. So that's kind of why we're, um, uh, we're here to answer this question. Um, oh, here we go, Paul. I do understand that you see a lot. I feel like a lot of things where people are asking for help or giving feedback, it gets ignored. I appreciate that your personal accounts are just that, but I feel that Coalition Gear's account could respond much, much more. So, valid. I'm going to explain to you the purpose of Coalition Gears. Coalition Gears prior to Gears 5 was our main way of running customer support. We didn't have the customer support service set up internally as, as a thing. Um, since then, it's been spearheaded and it's now, we've migrated support off of, that's why the DMs are closed on Coalition Gears. And now support.gearsaware.com is where, uh, where Coalition Gears is, um, uh, where that uh, is, is now more for updates You'll notice that uh, we do our like, hey, here's a here's an here's an issue, here's this, here's that, um, and that's what Coalition Gears is for. Um, it is not as active as as we are in our other as 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 other accounts are. It does get viewed. It's just the one that is not as active as that. So, I hope that answers your question a little bit. With that, um, uh, it, it it is looked at. Um, typically, usually when people tag Coalition Gears, they tag Gears of War and they end up tagging, depending on character count, Liam or myself or Rod or Ryan or various people like that. And you know, we go through and we, we do try to answer them and we do try to have the dialogue. Um, and a then, lot of the feedback is also design oriented, which all we can do on that stuff is kind just of pass, pass it, it through. Along. Or if we have an explanation behind something, we can give you a it's like context or explanation. Um, but if like, someone comes back and says like, um, I'm trying to think of a design feedback. The Lancer's too strong, fix the Lancer. That's like, that's like, I, we don't have the time to go back and respond to every tweet. Yep. It says something like, hey, thanks, we'll pass it along. If it's design feedback, we do track all that. I have a lot of, we have a lot of analytics tools that where we can go and look at the volume of conversation, we look at the sentiment of conversation. Yeah, we can see a and lot we, more than and we, and we, and we, and that does it. get shared back into the team. And, 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 and then when it's design oriented conversations, those are then our designers uh, have discussions around what they want to do. And then what we do is we say, hey, we see this is a, a big topic of conversation. And then A, are you going to change it? Are you going to tweak it? Or are you going to keep it as is? If you're going to keep it as is, can we get a, a little bit more context around why? So we can explain to you guys. Or we that's those are the times usually we bring Node on so he can provide context on the design. Because you know, I would rather come from him as it's as he is the one who is responsible for uh, for leading that area of the business when it comes to multiplayer. Um, so that's kind of how it is. I, I hope that answers your question a little bit more. I have been planning this video for a while and feedback and communication with devs was a point that I really wanted to make. I want to point out though that listening to Dana answer me a few times in that stream, the way I initially wanted to address this would have been totally wrong and unfair on him and the other devs who are often tagged on Twitter. So I've had to think about how I wanted to go about it because I really appreciate the time you took to go in depth with my questions. This is a gaming industry. The Coalition are the developers, we are the players, but essentially the Coalition are a company and we are the customers. I feel like as customers, once we have paid money for something, we should be entitled to support if there's an issue with it. At the end of the day, we purchase a product. If that product isn't working properly, then we should be entitled to support with it. If you were to buy a car and within a month the engine is broken and the suspension failed, you'd be looking at the garage that sold it to you to find out what's going wrong and what they're going to do about it.
It really is no different here. If people are having issues with a game, and this doesn't only apply to Gears or to TC, but it's any game, they should be entitled to support with it as a customer. I can't comment on other games' customer support as I don't tend to seek it in the same way I do with Gears, but I feel like in general, the support and communication we get from TC isn't good enough. This is where I feel the need to adjust what I was initially going to say. People such as Octus, Dana, Node, they really do get the brunt of it on their personal accounts and that's not really right. I'm I'm guilty of this myself, I often tag them. Um, but you know, you, you try and contact people who you feel you've got a better chance of getting a response from. And other than the Coalition account, who else can you tag? There's, there's nobody that we know of you can. It's been explained why the company account isn't used as much the same way it used to be, but I feel like there needs to be something in place to communicate with the players better. It seems like the most reliable way of hearing responses from TC now are these streams each week. Due to that I held a quick poll and found out that most people either didn't know the streams exist or they simply don't watch them. I feel like if we were to have this many unhappy customers in my place of work I'd have some serious explaining to do as to why that is. I feel like a big part of people's unhappiness in the Gears community is the lack of communication between players and devs, especially as most people don't watch these streams each week. So I feel like I don't hear enough and I'm always on Twitter, I'm watching the streams when I can and I feel like there's a lot of information I don't hear and I feel like there's a lot of my issues that I don't get addressed. So if there's people that don't really think about Twitter or don't watch these streams, they hear absolutely nothing. And I feel it'd be good for everybody to have their feedback heard and their issues helped. I feel that something could and should be put in place to help communicate between the developers and the community better. Because it's really not fair to have the same few people constantly being tagged on Twitter to have the same few people constantly be on these streams to have all those questions to answer. I don't know if that's something you have the manpower to do, I don't know. But even if these streams are the only thing that you can do, even if it's something small like the stream highlights linked to an in-game menu, just so somebody could click that and watch what's been discussed so they can keep up to date on what everybody else knows. I just feel like there needs to be something there to... Um, help feel like there's less of a brick wall between the players and the devs. So, um, if you, you guys can ask questions around that and we can talk a little bit more around that, but I just wanted to let you know... Um, oh, actually, uh, Paul, uh, I understand about why they have to go through cert testing, but why did all this go get through pre-release testing? That's a good question. So, um, there are... How can I explain this in a way that makes sense? Um, the testing of what we're doing, so there's certain refinements, there's certain things we're not going to notice, there's certain things uh, that was pre-released that are now becoming more evident. Uh, yep. A good example would be the weapon cloning one. Obviously, if we would have known that would have been in the game before the game, we would have removed it and eliminated it. There are times, and this is just not our game, this is every game. There's going to be bugs, there's going to be things inside of that. So those are, like, as much as I wish we could snap our fingers and, like, resolve all of that and everything, there are things inside of that that are just, sometimes dev teams just miss them. Or they're just bugs that end up happening. And you make a change and uh, like there's knock on things. Like we've made a change, like we could have made a change. I'm not, I don't know, I can't say this is for certain or not. It's not inconceivable that one of the changes that we've done have actually like resulted in another bug that yeah. we're now resolving and so on and so forth. Especially at the beginning when changes are happening very fast, which is why we've tried to slow down the pace. So that can all happen up that way. Yeah. So. Um, hopefully that gives you guys a little bit of context. I, I do know that the team is working very hard and very diligent and and yeah, and, it's and, and, speed, and, and, really. and 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 getting a lot of this stuff Even out there. Even if it doesn't feel like it, like the team are like full pedal to the metal. Like and and, to and right now, and what we want to do is we our intention is to be able to give you guys an indication on the big stuff that's going to be coming in TU2. <laughs> Firstly, the Syat gave me a good laugh. <laughs> that was a good one. Well done. <laughs> but in all seriousness, though, there's just not even that much to say on this. I do understand what you mean about bugs coming after an update due to something changing. I get that. But my initial question in relation to things getting through pre-release testing, I don't feel like a good enough job was done in looking for some issues. For example, falling to the map or things like this. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
and this. things like this not getting found before the game's released. I don't understand what got tested before the game was released but it certainly wasn't enough. Not just that but I see pretty much every week on Twitter that there's an issue with an event or something. Where does it end? Here's a where we felt we had a very unique post-launch DLC strategy for our maps. We had 10 maps in the box and we had 24 over a year. Uh, we thought that was really cool. Um, we had a combination of new maps uh, and uh, maps that w were some of the best from previous games. And in, in retrospect, uh, we probably bit off more than we could chew. We have looked at classic character unlocking schemes similar to what uh, was in Gears of War 3 in previous games, um, but we really wanted to embrace this vision of, of making almost every piece of content and characters earnable inside Gears of War 4. And we chose to uh, embrace the idea of flexibility where we're giving credits uh, wherever players are playing for them to be able to buy packs for free and get content for free. Um, we do recognize that what that missed was that signature content that only players that achieved a particular uh, level of status or uh, a particular challenge would be able to wear and show off. Uh, and we definitely recognize that and we've heard a lot of feedback about that. Um, this is a broad question. What's the deal with microtransactions? I feel like I want a little bit more granularity around that. No, I mean, you should, I think you should talk about why they exist. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, if you want to talk about why microtransactions exist, we talked about this last week. Microtransactions fund post-release content. Uh, if you figure everyone's like, but I already paid $60 for the game and I should get a bunch of other stuff. It's like, okay, I understand that. Like, the future content, uh, the ability for us to go and add new characters, new weapon skins, something like Hoffman or whatever, all of that kind of stuff, that gets connected back to microtransactions. Now, uh, that's kind of why they're there and that's like what you see every game is going down. They're like, the way games are built and designed now is so much different than they were not that long ago to where content is added continually after the game and the expectation of a of, of a consumer is that they want to be able to play a game that they love for a longer period of time and they want to be able to get fresh and new content on an ongoing basis and that and and and, and, and that in part gets done by microtransactions now that's in no comment on pricing or that the is structure just, of the system, he's just that's, explaining... That is why microtransactions exist. Why they're in exactly. modern games. It's that is not a, any commentary on our systems or pricing or... Ooh, like, yeah, that's, yeah, that, like, that's that. just... That is... If I, if I was working on one of a hundred games that were right now, I would give a very similar answer for that, whether it was for League of Legends or whether it was for um, Siege or Call of Duty or whatever, whatever it would be. So... This is something where I feel it's actually 50-50. 50% 50 of -50. 50 devs and 50% of the gaming community. This is not just TC, and you're actually crazy if you think it is. This is the gaming industry as a whole, and as Dana said, things have changed from how they were not even that long ago. We have to ask ourselves why. Most people instantly just jump to saying, oh, it's for the money. You know what? Yeah, as I said, it's 50-50, and it is for the money. Of course it's for the money. But what inspired that trend in the first place? Look at other games, games such as FIFA or Battlefront, players just they want to just buy things rather than earn it. Look at Destiny, players actually complained because they couldn't get end game items without completing end game tasks. Name of the raid, simply because they either couldn't do it or they didn't want to do it. People now say, well I don't want to do that but I want to be rewarded anyway. That's stupid. 
games that have rewards, they need to feel like they are rewards to those who earn them. Otherwise, why would anybody spend time trying to unlock them? Especially when they can be bought with real world money. As soon as something is made easier to unlock or is possible to be obtained with real world money, it loses all sense of value as a reward. Players nowadays actually complain that they can't buy things with real world money just because they've got a job and don't have time to play. So what? I've got a job. Last week I was working 13 and 15 hour shifts. In that time, somebody might have spent that whole time playing a game. I'm aware just how sad this example sounds, but it's an example. My reward for that time was money. That person's reward for that time should have been progress to something in-game that I didn't have any progress towards. I shouldn't then be able to spend my money on that just because I was at work. The player who earned it should be rewarded and I should not. I should then have to try and find a time to play and unlock it as well if it's part of the game. And if it's something that I don't want to do, if it's a part of the game that I don't want to do, then that's tough for me. I shouldn't then be rewarded just because I don't want to do it. The person that unlocked it and did that part of the game should get the reward and that's why they get a sense of accomplishment from earning that item. I want to show these as examples. Whilst I appreciate that following Gears 4, TC have listened to feedback in relation to RNG, I still feel like they've got it really wrong. Games don't need to have a constant stream of new content all the time. What works well is having a lot of content available at launch, and if it needs to be unlocked, have it so it takes a bit of a grind and it's not timed. This way, players have to complete specific tasks to earn them by actually playing the game that they're spending money on, if they have a job, then they aren't really missing out because they can get it eventually, and when you unlock something, it has some form of meaning to it, such as the weapon skins on Modern Warfare 2, or the characters on Gears 3. Both of these games, in my opinion, had great unlock systems that felt genuinely rewarding. I feel like gaming in general now actually uses DLC as a business plan, and that's wrong. In my opinion, this is telling me that they probably had things ready for the base game release, but they chose to leave it out and add it in later so they could charge us for it. I really don't like that. In the past, DLC used to be added by devs who you felt cared for their games and wanted to expand on it with things that would never have been ready for the time of the release, or if they had an idea afterwards. This could include things like story DLC or map packs. People would still buy these, and although I don't know the sales figures, I'd imagine this would still cover development costs from people purchasing them. But not now. We get a bunch of skins that nobody wants and we're expected to be happy with it. No, put those skins in the base game and make something that's worth people spending money on because people will buy it. People can complain all they want about how bad these microtransactions are and the prices of them. Yes, they are bad, but nobody is to blame other than the people who keep funding them. You can't spend X amount of money on something and complain that you've just bought it. This trend will not stop until it's no longer a money making option. I want to wrap this up by saying that I love Gears of War, but after conducting my own polls to gather statistics, it's evident to me that the extreme amount of players prefer the legacy titles over Gears 4 and 5, and I'm the same on that. I made this video in the hope that it can be seen by TC and hopefully considered as my aim is to try and help. I personally believe that these are the main current issues with Gears, and if addressed, Gears could possibly get better and again become the game that we all used to love and enjoy. I know this has been a long video, but I wanted to try and do this properly. If you're still here, then thanks for watching, seriously. I know I've been reading off a script and it might sound a bit robot, but I didn't want to miss anything out, so it feels a bit unnatural for me, so I've done my best, I'm sorry. But please give your thoughts, and I never only say this, but I'd really appreciate if you could share this out. Believe it or not, I've put an awful long time into making this.